Welcome. I hope everyone's having a fine and dandy evening, uh, despite the little bit of chill in the air. We were going to show a little short video, but there's a little technical difficulty on, on our end, so we're going to forego that. It was not real informative. It was just a little cute thing, so um, I, think, I think we can manage enough cuteness. So I am, <laughs> I am going to just simply introduce what we're doing. Uh, we have every year, we, first of all, I am the president of Phi Theta Kappa here at Rhone State. It's the Honor Society. Um, every year we do a couple of different projects to try to improve either our college, which is our college project, or our community, which is the Honors in Action. And that's what this is a result of. So what this is, is we have um, researched, we've, we've found that there is issue amongst the neurodiverse um, where there's not getting a diagnosis in Tennessee. And those who are not getting a diagnosis are females, the, uh, I'm sorry, people of color and people of low income. So before we can address anything, we have to know what we're addressing. And what we found in our research is not only are the diagnosis low, but there is a biasness that goes along with neurodiversity. And if you know anything about an iceberg, there's just a tip above the water, and then there's this hole underneath that's really the largest part of the iceberg. And that's kind of what this has happened here. You've got the tip above the water that everyone knows about. You know that if the kid gets in trouble all the time and they're so excited all the time, that's probably ADHD. If you know that the, the child is stimming all the time, that's probably a sensory disorder or autism. But what you don't realize, I apologize for this, <clears throat> what you don't realize is that there are so many more issues and um, wonders. It, it's not all problematic issues. There are wonders. As a matter of fact, in the middle of this research, <clears throat> I discovered there's a 99% chance that I have ADHD. When I told people around me, hey, I think I have ADHD, they went, and I said, I know, right? And they said, no, oh, you didn't know? So, but it does explain a lot. And I'm sharing that because I want everybody to understand that what we're doing here is not age related. It, we can be talking about children, we can be talking about adults, uh, any age and any spectrum. If you know anything about neurodiverse uh, orders, then you'll know that you can be a little bit or a whole lot ADHD or autistic. The point is, through this, um, through our lecture tonight, you may find yourself relating to a lot of things you hear um, in a very deep and personal way. It doesn't mean that you have ADHD or autism or dyslexia or any of the other many, many neurodivergent conditions. But it does prove our point that we're all diverse. We learn differently from one another. Learning is like fingerprints. No one person is the same. So it's not OK, and now this is our, our, our whole promotion. It's not OK to single out an individual or a group of individuals because they're behaving simply like we all do. So Kayla. Coper, our Vice President of Scholarship, is leading the research on this project. So I'm going to let her come up and speak in just a second. But first, I'm going to let you know that we have an occupational therapist with us tonight uh, from in Knoxville, and she's going to speak a little bit. <clears throat> Crystal Henley is her name. And then after intermission, we're going to come back and we're going to watch uh, our international speaker's video. She wasn't able to join us because swimming across the the lake there, or the pond as they call it, it was not in a timely uh, fashion that, that benefited us. So anyway, if you would welcome Kayla Coper, she's going to let you know what we found on our research. Hello. Well, like Deborah said, my name is Kayla Coper, and I'm a student here at Roan State Community College, as well as the Vice President Scholarship of Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank all of you for giving your time and attention this evening. I would also like to give a special thanks to our speakers who will share valuable information and perspectives on neurodiversity related topics. 
For those of you who are unfamiliar with terms like neurodiversity, neurodivergent, neurotypical, that's okay. It isn't a concept that is discussed widely enough and especially not often enough in mainstream media. I hope you find today's discussion to be informative on what neurodiversity is, why it's important, some of the challenges that are faced by neurodivergent individuals, specifically those diagnosed with autism, as well as what we aim to accomplish here at Roan State through PTK's Honors in Action Project. In 1998, a sociologist named Judy Singer coined the term neurodiversity to describe her revolutionary concept that utilizes a social model of disability where disabilities are not inherently pathological and societal barriers are the true disabling factors. In order to better describe the concept of neurodiversity, I would like you all to picture a biodiverse ecosystem. Each species has a niche role and no two parts of the system are exactly alike. Each has its own purpose and its own specialized traits in order to survive. Now, most of you probably know that the most efficient and thriving ecosystems are those with the most diversity and the widest range of differences. Well, our brains work the same way. No two people in this room have the exact same neurotype, none of you. The term neurodiversity is defined as a variation in the human brain regarding sociability, learning, attention, mood, sensory processing, and other mental functions. Neurodivergent individuals can include those diagnosed with autism, ADHD, social anxiety, sensory processing disorder, Tourette's, dyslexia, OCD, and a variety of mental health conditions and learning disorders. It is a wide spectrum. Those who don't have such conditions are considered neurotypical. Referencing our diversity example, because this very room is a mixture of neurotypical and neurodivergent minds, it can be considered neurodiverse. Though many advocacy groups promote the idea of neurodiversity, you will find that one of the most prominent is the autism rights movement. Because of this, as well as the needs that were discovered in our area, as Deborah discussed, a particular emphasis will be placed on autism during our discussion today. It should be considered, however, that autism is not the only condition placed under that neurodiversity umbrella. One of the most important facts to remember about neurodiversity is that it is just as beautiful and necessary as any other type of diversity. Every person is different and has a different set of strengths and weaknesses, and neurodivergence doesn't affect this fact. Most people who are neurodivergent often have many attributes that neurotypical, fi neurotypical people find valuable. For instance, many would say that neurodivergent individuals Individuals are typically loyal, out-of-the-box thinkers who have a specific or broad skill set based on their lived exp experiences. Excuse me. They may be extremely good at problem solving. They may be creative, organized, detail-oriented, and or outspoken. Despite stereotypes, not all neurodivergent individuals struggle with communication, and definitely not in the same way. So perhaps communication and marketing is their strong suit. Neurodivergent minds are all around us in the form of doctors, lawyers, actors, scientists, artists, educators, musicians, all of which holding a crucial role in our society. Each person, whether they're neurodivergent or neurotypical, is bright, vibrant, and important. Many neurodivergent individuals can even attribute their success to some degree to their condition-specific traits and experiences, though it should be noted that each neurodivergent condition comes with a different set of those experiences and traits, and every single person will have a unique perspective. Overall, however, the main obstacles that neurodivergent individuals often speak of are societal in nature. One of the main common tenets of any neurodivergent social movement is the strive for equity and inclusion. And this typically stems from how we view disability as a whole. Disability isn't a bad word. Often it can be a way of life and identity or a platform to those who face medical, educational, and societal barriers. Harmful stereotypes, misinformation, and negative associations like functioning labels often present the positive traits of neurodivergent individuals, particularly those diagnosed with autism, from being recognized. We like to think of the autism spectrum as looking like a sliding bar where on one end you're more autistic and on the other less, but in reality, it has been found that the spectrum looks something like a color wheel or spider chart, as you can see, with different traits and skills being represented in different areas. Dots may be placed in each of those areas and it will differ based on every unique individual. The issue with functioning labels has more to do with the fact that terms like low functioning are degrading to someone's self-esteem. In truth, these terms are often inherently inaccurate and harmful for people of all neurotypes. 
For instance, a nonverbal or semi-speaking autistic adult may be thought of as low functioning when their other traits simply just do not reflect this. Um, those individuals, as well as those who are nonverbal a majority of the time, may prefer to use alternative forms of communication, such as sign language, devices, or more creative forms. And their communication is no less valid or valuable than someone who uses verbal speech, or even a deaf person using alternative communication in the same way. However, unlike someone who is deaf or hard of hearing, when an autistic person uses this form of communication, they're thought of as low functioning. Another thing that should be noted is that many autistic people go through states of burnout where communication may be temporarily altered. And that is another reason that sometimes their functioning labels may wax and wane, and they may be considered low functioning. And those who are thought of as low functioning often experience infantilization. Infantilization is very harmful for adults with disabilities. While those with learning disabilities and neurodivergent conditions like autism, ha they may behave differently, perhaps in a way that may be perceived as childlike or delayed. A disabled adult is still an adult. The treatment of adults with disabilities should not be any different than how we treat adults who do not have disabilities. Likewise, terms like high functioning are no less harmful. Often when a person is considered high functioning, like those who were f diagnosed with what was formerly called Asperger's syndrome, they're seen as less autistic, or in other words, more normal. This cannot be any farther from the truth. The reason some are considered high functioning has to do with some individuals having an average or above average IQ and better masking abilities. For those who are unfamiliar with the term masking, it is a way that autistic individuals camouflage their condition specific traits in order to fit in or appear more normal. In other words, autistic people can be incredible actors. This is problematic as it is immensely draining and stressful for autistic people to mask. For reference, imagine that you are dropped in a foreign country and you must act like you are a natural born citizen. You must be familiar with all of the social customs, the language, the mannerisms, the expectations. You also cannot let anyone know you're nervous and your, your body language mustn't offend anyone. This means that every action, every gesture, every word, every behavior is carefully watched and will determine and reflect the way that you are perceived and assigned worth. Sound stressful? <laughs> this is sometimes what it is like to be autistic, except there are no language books to help translate when people require others to read between the lines or assume how they're feeling. Also, there isn't a guide on appropriate levels of eye contact or personal space. Neurotypical behaviors that do not come naturally to neurodivergent people are exhausting to keep track of and mimic. Because individuals considered to be high functioning are good at this kind of masking, they are viewed as needing less support and thus they re often receive little to none of the support they actually need from a young age. And this doesn't set them up for success as adults. It can also cause expectation of these individuals to be unrealistic, which leads to burnout, anxiety, as well as a wide range of other mental health conditions. Masking is particularly prominent in females on the autism spectrum. Part of this is why women are significantly underdiagnosed. Autism, like many neurodivergent conditions, presents differently based on gender, biological sex, race, and background. Those assigned female at birth present autistic traits that are particularly deviant from those that are used in traditional screenings. For instance, they have been found to be better at masking and are typically better at scripting and social mimicry, and their special interests may be considered more typical. This means that they're often overlooked and misdiagnosed. In fact, many women and individuals assigned female at birth are not diagnosed with an autism spectrum condition until their late teens or even until their own kids are diagnosed and they recognize traits in themselves. Often at this point, there are few, if any, diagnostic services available to them. A girl on the spectrum may have simply been considered shy, bookish, quirky. Often those who are considered high functioning in general are disregarded as just weird or nervous, especially if their academic and behavioral performance is positive or typical. Because of this, as they get older and begin to struggle with life skills, social performance, or other challenges, their mental health may be affected as well. Unfortunately, anxiety, depression, and suicide rates are higher among autistic individuals than neurotypical individuals across all age groups. 
People of color and those in low-income areas, as Deborah mentioned, are also facing a lack of resources and as a result under diagnosis. The state of Tennessee, for instance, has only a 2% diagnostic rate, whereas all of the surrounding states in the region have at least 4% or higher. And this isn't because there are less autistic people. Many communities where there is a higher percentage of minorities have less medical resources in general, which often leaves those with health needs, including autism, completely out of options. There are calls to update the checklists used for screenings, as well as introduce alternative or extra measures for diagnosis, especially in these low-income areas. It's also why the autistic community often accepts those who self-diagnose, as they may not have had the resources available to them to receive a proper diagnosis. Despite a lack of official diagnosis, their experiences as a neurodivergent individual are just as valid and just as unique. Another obstacle that autistic people face is employment. According to the Kennedy Krieger Organization, it's estimated that around 2% of the entire population has an atypical neurological structure, or in other words, is neurodivergent. Considering the statistics on underdiagnosis in women, people of color, and those in low-income areas, this rate is likely a lot higher. More than 58% of autistic individuals in their early 20s are unemployed. This figure changes to as high as 80% when applied to all autistic adults. Those who do manage to find employment often hold part-time jobs or are otherwise underemployed with little benefits. There are many complex reasons for this. However, I would like to highlight those involved in the hiring process first. Individuals with autism often struggle to fit the profiles that employers seek. According to the Director of Inclusive Hiring at Microsoft, Neil Barnett, many autistic individuals wouldn't even get through an initial phone screening because perhaps they would only give yes or no answers or wouldn't elaborate on their other skills during questioning. The interview process is complicated and constructed of highly complex socially sanctioned communication, both verbal and nonverbal. A commonality amongst those on the autism spectrum is social impairment. These communication differences alone can cause the interviewer to deem an autistic individual unworthy of, of the position simply by the way they act, speak, or appear. For instance, an autistic person may have a delay in speaking or processing, difficulty reciprocating social interaction, or miss social cues and appear repetitive. Traditional interview techniques require the person being interviewed to illustrate excellent nonverbal communication verbal communication and dress in a manner, a certain manner, in order to make a good impression. However, those with autism often struggle with things like eye contact, either making too little or too much, have odd posture, and some interview appropriate attire may be too overwhelming to those with sensory processing challenges. The environment may have distractions, such as being too cold, bright, or have strong smells. In order to cope with their environment, an autistic individual may partake in self-soothing, stimulatory behaviors called stimming, as Deborah mentioned. Stimming can look like anything from hair twirling to finger tapping, leg tapping, to rocking back and forth. The potential employer may mistake this for them being nervous, bored, or simply too fidgety or uninterested, which don't give the right impression. Even if small changes were made to the interviewing process, it would tremendously help those with autism better illustrate what skills and experiences they have to offer. When considering hiring many autistic people, companies often worry about accommodations. While we would like to think that companies value skilled employees, often the fear of financial burden can cause employers to discriminate against disabled individuals. The ADA and other discrimination laws prevent this type of bias to some extent, but it still occurs at a high rate. There is also the great fear of unknown that people exhibit. Each individual will have individualized needs and those are gonna be hard to predict. It's worth noting, however, that a lot of accommodations cost little or nothing, especially in the long run, such as providing a safe space, allowing breaks, and conducting training and team building exercises. Team building exercises have been incorporated into the interview process in some hiring programs to illustrate skills in a way that member mimics an actual workplace scenario. This allows autistic individuals to better illustrate what they have to offer. A particular concern that employers may have when it comes to accommodations is also the reaction of their other employees. For instance, many employees would find it unfair if someone was allowed extra breaks or if they were exempt from certain job-related activities such as going to a crowded conference. However, with training and transparency about reasonable accommodations, including those 
with autism being able to work the same, but maybe a flexible hours, many of these issues would be resolved. The main thing to consider if you are an employer or if you are preparing someone who is neurodivergent to enter the workforce is that the standards in that workforce do not reflect the needs of those with neurodivergent conditions. And therefore, a strive for equity and inclusion is a must. Overall, neurodiversity it is a concept that describes a natural variation in the human brain with respect to a social model of disability that states that societal barriers are the true obstacles for neurodivergent people. There are many obstacles which we must address to, in order to achieve true inclusion, acceptance, and an equitable society in which people with hidden disabilities can thrive. These include recognition of traits, increased and more adequate diagnoses, better resources, better therapies, and an overall movement to destigmatize disability while realizing and taking note of the reasonable accommodations which can be made. Many people with hidden disabilities such as autism do not have the support they need and with even less available resources on mental health specific to that neurodivergent lens and that is so important. Their experiences must be heard as any reputable professional knows that the true expert on a specific condition as it pertains to that individual is that individual. Often neurodivergent people are best at advocating for their own rights, experiences, and aspirations for what a successful future looks like for the neurodivergent. Sometimes stigma gets in the way, however, causing it to be harder to identify neurodivergency. You may not know who around you is neurodivergent or neurotypical. As an anonymous Roan State student who has multiple neurodivergent conditions stated to me recently, I'm sure there are a lot of people like me who also hide stuff from everyone because they're afraid to admit it. They also brought to light the point that many family members, instructors, employers, and others in their life may be less accepting of their condition and their identity, and so they're less inclined to reach out for help. I felt that it was important to include more neurodivergent voices in our discussion today, so I reached out to my neurodivergent friends and peers and asked if they would be comfortable sharing some things that they wish that all neurotypical people knew, and here were the responses that I got. We, neurodivergent people, perceive things differently. We may miss social cues that neurotypical people would have no problem with. Don't assume that we will assume. People need to be patient with those with ASD which is autism spectrum disorder. Neurodivergent people often can spend their entire lives pretending to be someone they are not when it is so easy for this world to be one of inclusion and acceptance. Neurotypical people should think of others and realize that some people just need patience. Yelling and frustration can trigger panic attacks and other issues. People should in general think about others. And I think that is all encompassed by one of the responses that I got, which was, we all think differently. And this is something we forget all too, all too often, excuse me. I hope that one day we can eliminate the misinformation, stereotypes, and societal obstacles that stand in the way of neurodivergent individuals. And I personally will not stop advocating until that day comes. However, it takes more than just spreading information. It takes action. Through PTK's Honors in Action project, I hope to see a change in more than just a community level, but instead a rippling effect which leads to a better tomorrow for people of all neurotypes and all abilities. I'd now like to turn it over to a woman who is an occupational therapist and the owner of Sensory Puzzles Incorporated, a healthcare organization in, Knoxville, in the Knoxville area. As an occupational therapist, she addresses physical, cognitive, psychosocial, sensory, and other aspects of occupational performance in a variety of contexts to support engagement in everyday life activities that affect health, well-being, and quality of life. Please turn your attention to Ms. Crystal Henley. Sorry, I'm not very tech savvy, so um, it takes me a minute to get things started. Um, before I start talking about occupational therapy and the things that go along with that, um, I wanted to kind of get a feel for who all we have in the room. How many parents do we have? OK. 
Okay. And, and educators? Okay. And then how many people do we have who have um, disabilities? Okay. Okay. So we, we've got a bunch of different people here. Okay. Um, well, like she said, my name is Crystal Henley, um, and I have been working as an occupational therapist for 17 years. Um, I've primarily been working in the pediatric population for the last 14 years. Um, but pediatrics is, as far as disability deficits go, isn't any different than adults. Um, but let's see which she already kind of went over um, what occupational therapy does, but um, most people, when I tell them I'm an occupational therapist, they say, oh, you help people find jobs. And um, that's not what we do at all. <laughs> um, we help people be able to function better in society is basically the main goal. Um, when working with the pediatric population, we look at fine motor skills and visual motor skills, all, like that developmental type stuff. But then there's this whole other realm that not everybody talks about, um, which is sensory processing. And sensory processing is hard to understand because there's so much misinformation out there. And, you know, you go and Google that and you're going to get tons of opinions and lots of different terms and none of it makes sense. So that's kind of what I'm going to do is try and help that make sense. Um, so, okay, sensory integration is basically being able to take all the information in from your environment, process it appropriately in the brain, and then have the correct motor response or behavioral, behavioral response. Um, it's not something that you have to think about. It's something that happens automatically, and it all depends on how your brain is functioning. And all of us, we all have sensory problems. We just don't realize it. Um, right here in the front, you've been moving your feet the whole time I've been talking. Um, that That's a sensory thing. Um, I have to move my legs and my feet, too, when someone is talking because I don't know how to sit still in a classroom anymore, so I have to be moving something. And just because we all have sensory things that we need in order to pay attention or in order to get through the day, it doesn't mean that we have a disorder. It's only a disorder when it impacts your ability to function in your environments. This is my favorite thing in the whole world. I use this all the time. Okay, when you think about, you know, your senses, your sensory systems, you know, we have those five that everybody talks about, you know, hearing, taste, smell, but there are two other big important systems that nobody really talks about because they don't understand it and they don't understand how they work. So this is a pyramid of the central nervous system. The foundation, that bottom piece, those are your foundational systems and everything else kind of builds on top of that. So if you're missing a part in that bottom in that foundation, all the other stuff is not going, going to come like it should. It's not going to go well. So the tactile system, that's really easy to understand. That's being able to touch things, tolerate other people touching you, being able to, you know, put your hand down in your purse and find your keys, you know, being able to detect your keys from your wallet, things like that. Um, I do see a lot of kids who have tactile problems, and it's not just, a, oh, I don't want you to touch me or my clothes don't feel good. It, it manifests itself in so many different ways that nobody really thinks about. Um, I have a lot of kids who like touch and vision go, go closely together. And I have a lot of kids who they like they see Play-Doh and they're thinking about how that Play-Doh would feel. And then they throw up just because they're thinking of how it would feel. And that's more often what, what I see and more often what I work with. 
the middle part, the vestibular system, that is the system that processes movement. So it tells your, your head where it is in relation to your body. Um, the receptors for that are, are in the inner ear. It's your semicircular canals and your autolith organs in the semicircular canals, you have fluid, and depending on how your head is moving, the fluid moves in different directions, and that sends signals to our brain to tell us how we're moving in space and you know what's happening around us. So my favorite example is um, if you're in a car and someone else is driving and they stop really fast and you're not ready for that stop, your and your body has that like odd sensation that's your vestibular system trying to calculate the movement your body went through and try and figure out where you are in space and all children who have autism have sensory deficits not all children or people who have sensory processing disorder have autism so it's totally different and people don't understand that and lots of things are commonly misdiagnosed. But um, I'm getting off, off my topic here. Um, the proprioceptive system, that's comprised of the muscles and joints in your body. It's what tells you where your body is in relation to other objects and it tells, you how, it tells your body how to move. So if you have stairs in your house and you know you can run up your stairs pretty quickly that's because your proprioceptive system the muscles have already learned how much they need to contract and relax in order for you to go up and down the stairs and you know there's always those days when you try and go up and down your stairs real fast and you fall or you stumble your sensory systems are probably not working as well that day um, but that's kind of how that works um, I am not big on sitting down so if you're comfortable, I'm going to have everyone stand up. Okay. Now I want you to close your eyes. Okay. And put one arm behind you. Okay. Now somebody tell me how you know your arm is behind you. You, you can feel it because of the muscles and joints in your body. And that's what the proprioceptive system does. It, it, when your muscles and joints, when they stretch and move, it sends the signals to your brain. And if you're not processing that appropriately, they're, they're those kids that are clumsy. Um, they bump into other kids. They can't keep their place in line. Um, and I have a lot who just don't even understand how to walk up and down steps. Um, and there's so many um, simple things that you don't think about that we take for granted. Okay, so now we're going to do another one just because it's fun and something different. Okay, so everybody close your eyes again. Okay, I want you to imagine you're standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Okay, and you're looking out, you know, over the Grand Canyon and, it, you know, it's beautiful, it's nice and serene. And then all of a sudden, a group of kids come behind you and one of them accidentally hits you and jostles you forward, how would you feel? Scared? Um, nervous? Anxious? Kids who have vestibular problems, they tend to feel like that all day long. And so every day for them, no matter where they're at, no matter what environment, they feel like they're standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon and someone has pushed them forward. And, you know, I can't imagine how um, disconcerting and how horrible that would feel to have that sensation all the time. Now, to do the tactile system, um, can I have two volunteers right here? <laughs> okay, okay. All you have to do is... One of you sticks your fingers out, okay? And you're gonna put your fingers together like this, okay? Okay, now, the one in the black dress. Okay, I want you to take your other hand and I want you to feel your finger. 
Okay, and close your eyes. Feel your finger and then feel your friend's finger. Doesn't it feel odd? Doesn't it feel totally different? It does, yeah. Yeah, and, and kids who have tactile problems, they, they don't feel their body, they don't feel their skin the same way. It feels like it's somebody else's a lot of times. Okay, now you guys can sit down. This is just another little chart that explains what we've already talked about. Oh, but wait, I want to go back to this for a minute. Okay, children who, um, who are not speaking, whether they're autistic or whether they have sensory problems or it doesn't really matter what's going on, um, you know, the big thing is, is everybody's like, oh, go to speech therapy, go to speech therapy, it's gonna help them talk. And yes, that's what speech therapy does. But a lot of times, if you don't work on the sensory system, you know, they can spend years in speech language therapy before they ever actually produce language. But what I found is if I see a child right before they go to speech or right after speech, and I do things that stimulate the vestibular system, if you look right above vestibular, you'll see auditory. If you can stimulate that vestibular system and then they go into speech therapy, words are gonna come faster. Just because you've already got the part of the brain active that needs to be active in order to help produce speech. So it all works together, it all works hand in hand. Um, a big thing that no one talks about anymore is if you continue up from vestibular, you'll see reflex maturity children who have autism, children who have ADHD, ADD, sensory processing disorder, a lot of them still have reflexes that they shouldn't have. You know, when you're a baby, you have certain reflexes that teach you how to move and help you learn how to move your body and how to look. A lot of, a lot of the kids with, even my kids with NAS, which is kids who are drug exposed, which is super prevalent here in Tennessee, um, they, their reflexes don't mature like they're supposed to. Your reflexes should all mature by the age of two. And most of my children who have autism, um, they still have their Moro reflex. And that's your startle reflex. And when you still, when you're still kind of hanging on to that reflex, you have increased levels of cortisol and adrenaline in the brain. So those are the stress chemicals. And so you're in a constant state of heightened stress, heightened awareness all the time. And you know, it's important you have to address that bottom and then kind of go up and get that reflex maturity part. So I always tell people sensory integration therapy is like, it's like you have an onion. Okay, and you have to figure out the biggest layer, the one that's causing the most problems first. And then once you get that layer gone, then you gotta go to the next one and the next one. But typically once you get that big layer gone, the one that's the most efficient, the others come much quickly, much more quickly. Yeah, we already did all this stuff. I had some super nice handouts to bring everyone, and I left them at home. So if anyone would be interested in any kind of handouts, I have um, the pyramid handout, and I have um, one that just talks about what sensory integration is, um, and that's just kind of a handout I made from looking at lots of different things and some research. Um, and I also have a couple of handouts if like educators or even parents would be interested in them. Um, I have one that has vestibular activities that help to stimulate the vestibular system, proprioceptive and tactile activities. So. If anybody wants to give me an email, I would be happy to um, send those to you. Let's go to here, okay. Sensory processing di disorder is the big term right now for kids who have sensory problems. You know, about 10 years ago, it was sensory integration disorder, but they're the same thing. It's just different words which is why sensory can be so confusing because everyone uses different words, but they all mean the same thing. So I, I try and stay away from um, using a bunch of different words because it's just too confusing. 
Um, typically, um, in the preschool age, kids who have sensory problems, I see them having difficulty um, sitting still. They want to be in constant motion. And those kids who need to be in constant motion, their vestibular system isn't working as efficiently as it should. So it's like every time they move, they can't process what they're doing. So their brain tells them to move more, which is the opposite of what they should do. And it's just kind of this like constant snowball effect. Um, and I, a lot of those kids who have trouble sitting still are my kids who when they get into school, get into kindergarten, they don't have a diagnosis. They just have sensory problems and nobody understands what that is. So they fall through the cracks. Those are the kids who test super well, IQ wise, developmental wise, but they can't sit in a classroom and listen to the teacher and learn. So the testing is not very, very good in that aspect as far as getting into school. Um, and my sensory kids, when they do get into school and they can keep everything calm and hold it in for the whole, you know, seven hours, however long school is, they go home and they're terrible. They just like, they let it all out. Um, and, you know, even children who have autism, I've had some tell me, you know, that they sit still in the classroom and it's like they want to sit on their hands so they can be still and do what everyone else is doing. And then when they get home, they have to go to their room and lick their hands over and over just to calm down. And, and while that might sound crazy to us, that's what they need to stay calm. And, you know, everybody needs something. Your legs are crossed right now. You know, that's a proprioceptive thing. You're giving yourself more input. And, you know, we all do things, but they don't always look odd. Um, kids who have vestibular problems, a lot of them have difficulty sleeping. And it's because you think about when you're asleep, think about how many times you move and how many times you turn over and don't even realize it. Kids who have vestibular problems, as soon as they go to move when they're asleep, it wakes them up because it's too alerting to their system because they don't process it like we do. And if they can calm down to go to bed, they can sleep for about four hours and then they're awake. And then they have to go through their whole calming down routine again. And then four hours later, they're awake again. Um, and those are the poor parents who come in and they have the dark circles under their eyes and they're drinking coffee and they're like, I'm so tired because they don't ever get sleep. Um, as far as occupational therapy, how it helps with sensory integration or sensory processing, um, like I said, you want to find the system that is the most efficient, work on that system first. And this is going to sound crazy, but you have to understand um, if you're dealing with kids who have sensory problems that yes, their, their main problem may be vestibular, but they can't come in and you do all movement activities because their brain doesn't process that. So when they come in to see me, I have to do activities that stimulate the proprioceptive system because they can process that. And then the tactile system. And it's like you get all these different parts of the brain working and active before you go to the one that is not working as efficiently. And so not everybody realizes that. Um, all occupational therapists, we all, no matter what school you go to, you um, learn the same things. Most schools, you get one or two days on sensory integration, and that's it. So not all occupational therapists do sensory integration therapy. Some may think they do, but there are only, um, well, this was a couple of years ago, there are only 11 of us that are certified in the Knoxville area um, to diagnose sensory integration disorder and to actually treat it. Um, so it's very important that if you're a parent or even an educator trying to, you know, send someone where they need to go, you want to find a therapist who's actually skilled in what that child needs. 
if I had a hand problem and had to have hand surgery, I would definitely go see an occupational therapist who is certified in hand therapy just because that's what they know and that they know how to how to treat and the movements the exercises you need to do it's the same thing with sensory integration you have to have special training to be able to understand it and um, I have a lot of kids who come see me after they've been to another therapist and their parents will tell me yeah you know they don't like to get in the ball pit and you know our other therapist just threw them in because you know they need to be in the ball pit and they need to move and I was like what did your child do when the therapist threw them in the ball pit well they threw up and screamed for the next five hours that's not what they needed and these kids who have sensory problems they're actually really good if you watch their body at telling you what they can and what they cannot tolerate and if they cannot tolerate something like they don't want to go into the ball pit heaven forbid don't make them because you're just going to make their life the rest of the day terrible um, and there are a lot of very specific um, training and activities you can learn to help with ADHD. Um, I have a lot of um, educators in um, like the Knoxville school system who do BALAVIS and that stands for, well this slide's actually messed up, that stands for Balance, Auditory, and Vision. And what that is is kids who have ADHD or even kids who have ADD, you can bounce a ball in a certain way and the sound of the ball and someone else catching it and then someone sending it back to you, that helps to calm their brain down. And you know, they can be like way up here, you know, kind of, kind of crazy and hyper. And you start doing things like that and they just calm right back down to normal. And then they can sit down and learn. Um, other things for ADHD, um, they have the whole um, how does your engine run program and basically what that is is you're teaching kids who are hyperactive how to self-regulate and how to be able to calm down and they learn what activities make them super hyper, what makes their engine too high, activities that makes their engine too low and then there are activities that make it just right and help them calm back down to be where they need to be. I don't know how much you guys want to know about sensory integration. I can continue to talk about it or I can take questions now. It's whatever you want. Because um, I have a lot more slides, but I'm not sure that everybody wants to hear them. You guys want me to continue? Okay. Okay. Um, proprioceptive activities are always calming. Just like with your legs crossed, you're a much calmer person. The, any input to the body um, is calming. Any like, uh, like pushing and pulling kind of input or even um, walking up and down the stairs, that can be calming to the body. Proprioceptive activities never overstimulate the brain. They never overstimulate a child. But you have to be really careful with, um, well, it doesn't go in the way I'm talking. You have to be really careful with vestibular activities because vestibular activities, that input can stay in the body for up to 23 hours. So, you know, if a person, you know, watched a little merry-go-round and they watched that for I don't know three minutes sometimes that person can be dizzy for the next 23 hours and that is crazy to think about that but I see that a lot and you know it's like she was talking about the masking you just don't realize they feel that way unless they're throwing up or unless they've shut down and fallen asleep um, but as adults a lot of times you don't realize what they're going through um, it's easier with the kids you know, because uh, they'll definitely let you know. I don't think I need to go over those. Um, 
tactile activities, those can be very overstimulating or they can be calming depending on the child. Not every child's the same, not every person is the same as far as what sensory activities are calming or what, what's alerting to them. So you always have to be aware that, you know, everybody's different and the way their brain processes is always different too. Um, and it's nice to um, allow people to be different. Like when I go to um, an occupational therapy, like a continuing education course, you have those really good instructors who will be like, hey, if you need to get up, if you need to walk to the restroom, go get some water, feel free to. It's not going to disturb me when I'm talking. Or if you need to stand in the back of the room and balance on one foot or sit on a ball, that's fine too because everybody needs something different in order to be able to learn or function in their daily routine. Now, do you all have any questions for me? And there might be more now. That was a couple of years ago. Trying to find, I am shocked when you said 11. When I, was, when I was looking for you, I was really like, wow, there is not much help available at all for anyone. There's not. Um, so my question is, uh, is this is occupational therapist something that insurances would cover? All major insurances cover occupational therapy. Um, ten care, all the ten cares cover it. Um, most all Blue Cross Blue Shield plans cover it. Cigna, Humana, Aetna, United Healthcare. Um, the only thing is, is if you, you know, if someone has commercial insurance, you know, there's going to be a cap. They're going to be able to have 60 OT visits per year, and then that's with a child and then when that child gets older and say they still need therapy well they've got 20 visits a year so it's, it's limited but insurance does pay for it um, and, and talking about you know it's hard to find um, a pediatric OT um, who actually can help a child uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say anybody's bad or any, you know, anybody's good. I'm just, it's just nice to be aware because um, I have so many parents who will take kids somewhere and they know nothing about therapy and they don't understand what it is or what their child needs. And they'll go for like a year or six months and they don't make any progress. In fact, a lot of times they regress. Um, and that's um, just really sad because the younger they are, the easier things are to help correct and help them function better. I'm going to be directing a Christmas play mm -hmm. with little ones, and there are two nonverbal aut uh, autism children, and one is uh, hyper. <laughs> yes. So would you suggest something, an activity for them? Yes. Um, and I have that whole list of proprioceptive activities I would be happy to send you. Um, what I do a lot when, when I have kids who are hyper, you know, sometimes um, in doing therapy, like maybe something will get them a little too overstimulated. I like to put them in the corner and put bean bags on top of them, and that is very calming for them, for most of them. Um, I'm not... Don't smother anybody with bean bags, but but if you know a nice little box to kind of sit in and chill out, um, that's always good. Um, I tell parents at home that um, it's best to make like a calming corner, and that can be you know it can be a box, it can be something fancy like a tent, or it can be just a corner and you just like tack a blanket up in the corner and make a triangle to make a little roof. And when they're hyper or when they're overstimulated in some way, they need to go to their calming corner. And they can have a blanket, a stuffed animal, a book, something that they like. And once they go to that corner, it helps to teach them to regulate how they feel and to calm down themselves without someone else having to externally do something. 
if that makes sense. I'm a big, huge fan of calming corners and um, small spaces. But I, I will be happy to send you that whole list, and it's got a lot of different ideas on it. When I first started doing um, sensory integration therapy, I really didn't have any clue what I was doing. Um, and I remember, well, I wasn't actually doing sensory integration therapy. I was just treating um, pediatric kids. I remember I went home and I told my mom, you know, this is going on with this kid and blah, 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 and they really need a professional. And then my mom just looked at me and she said, I think you are the professional. And then I was like, oh, I have to go to more classes and I have to understand more because I would hate to, you know, do a disservice to, you know, any child, any adult, anybody. Um, it does. It does. It's, it's kind of funny with um, the pediatric population and therapy. You know, we typically see them one time a week, um, and you would think that's not very much, but when they're little, like even when they're two and three, they don't always have to do a whole lot at home. The therapy just kind of seems to carry over eventually. I mean, it takes a while. It's not, you know, overnight. Children who have vestibular problems, I typically see them for at least a year. Um, <clears throat> and I try not to give parents too many things to do at home except easy things like a calming corner because I don't go home with those kids. I see those kids for an hour. So that parent that goes home with them, I know they already have a full schedule and they have to try and keep this child calm, you know, all day long. So. I hate to give them too much to do and then them come in the next week and I say, oh, you know, did you do your home program? And they'll be like, no, because they don't have time and they can. But implementing easy things like a calming corner um, is good. I give a lot of parents who are interested in doing things at home a sensory diet, which that is not food. A sensory diet is basically just a list of sensory activities um, at specific to do at specific times during the day. And what it does is it's called a diet because it feeds the brain and it keeps the brain um, working more efficiently. So those, those are very helpful, but it's also, you know, hard to get them implemented all the time. What kind of room are you in? A. Is it a, like a classroom? Yeah, it's like a classroom. Okay. Um, do you have access to the internet? Yes. I had a really good slide, and I just, I believe I deleted it from this um, slideshow, but gonoodle.com is a free website that's provided through Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and it has so many movement and um, other kinds of activities that all the kids can do together. And I prefer for everybody to be doing the same thing so that nobody looks different. Um, but that's got some excellent activities that can just kind of not necessarily just calm them down, but help them refocus and, you know, kind of get where they need to be. And plus, you know, those kids have been sitting in their classroom all day long, and they've held it together all day long. So doing some of those activities on Go Noodle will help them get that movement out that they need and kind of help feed their brain what it needs. Um, and if you had some bean bags in the back of the room, and, you know, at first you would have to tell the kids, hey, you know, I think you I think you need a beanbag break and not make it a bad thing but hey let's just go have a beanbag break and that way they can have a place where 
like a, the bean bag gives you some proprioceptive input, which is the calming input, and it just helps everything settle back down. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, well, like, um, on my website it says I see birth to 12. I see birth to 21. So the, I, I don't consider it an adult until they're over 21. Um, you know, if you look at research about sensory integration, it's going to tell you by the age of 10, all the connections that they're going to make in the brain, they're already made, and they're not going to be able to learn or make progress. But I 100% disagree with that, um, not because I've done research myself, but because I've seen how therapy can help. And, you know, you think of someone who's had a stroke. Well, they can still learn how to do things again, so... You know, why can't someone who's 22 still benefit from sensor integration therapy? Um, but typically, you know, I have like 16 and 17 year olds who don't want to come into therapy because my place looks like um, it's for little kids. Um, so those kids I see like once a month and I make them be responsible and give them things to do at home. and and I just hope and pray that they do them at home. When we take a break, I would be happy if someone wants to get a piece of paper and if you guys want to write down email addresses, I would be happy when I go home. I might not get it done tonight. I'm just going to be honest. But I will get it done let's say before Monday, I'll give myself a deadline before Monday, but I will get all those handouts sent to you. And that way you'll have them. And if you want to print something out, you can. If you're like, oh, that's not going to pertain to me. I don't need that. Then you don't have to print it out. Okay. Wow. She's incredible. This is the first time I've gotten to meet her. I'm, I'm very impressed. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to release you for a 10-minute break so you can go out and grab you a drink and a snack and then come right back and listen to another maybe 40, 45-minute uh, spiel. And I'm going to introduce real quick the lecture boxes. Uh, I'm sorry, the Discover Calm boxes. What this is is tonight's lecture night. Uh, prior, we reached out to organizations that are already set up and established as outreach uh, programs. For example, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, Kiko, which is Knoxville Inner City Kids, the, um, the YMCA, oh goodness, we actually have reached out to 15 different organizations and we delivered them a box personally and invited them out and several of them have been in touch with me but um, to, to say, oh, yes, please, we need our boxes, but we can't be here tonight, or they will be attending uh, through the live stream. And I would like to welcome and thank everyone for, for joining on the live stream. So with the box, when, the reason we took them the box is they're full of information. How can we get a free or reduced cost if we need it diagnosis? Because as you heard us talk, where do you go get one? Um, a lot of adults that are neurodiverse, as earlier mentioned, have a hard time holding jobs. So they find themselves in need of a place to stay or food or some sort of financial help. So any and all help available just about in the entire state of Tennessee, especially the eastern half here, there's places listed for food, medical insurance, vision, dental, medical clinics, um, and good information on what is neurodiversity so it's full of information over 50 pages of information and then there are noise canceling or noise reducing headphones to address some of the sensory orders or disorders we talked about to i heard once that if you were to wake up because someone turned the light on you real quick in the middle of the night and you opened your eyes the pain that you experience that 
is what is happening when someone's overloaded with um, light or sound. You know, you, she, uh, Ms. Henley mentioned being on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Well, another good example is if you're not expecting an ambulance to come up behind you and it just startles you and it makes you just so on edge. You know, that, that's one thing to, to have to experience that. But then as you go on through the day, that person cuts you off. You're already aggravated, and now you're more so aggravated. And then the light from the person that almost cut you out got right in your eye, and that's even more so. And a lot of times, adults, and especially children, do not know what's going on. And whenever something uh, in the way of a hint is mentioned, then what? What do we do? Where do we go? How do, how do I know how to handle this? So the sensory... Uh, issues. We've got noise reducing headphones and we have sunglasses. There are chew necklaces to help with the stimming and the nervous tics. There are also the fidget toys and I think that's what most people are, are familiar with, the little fidget spinners and stress balls. And, and those things are hot sellers. So if, if you say, well, let's look, at the cells, let's look at the cells on the fidget toys and let's look at the diagnosis, you're going to see something's way, way off. So the, the the people that we've invited, the organizations we've invited via a box invitation, once they have gone through a little bit of our, um, our input, you know, we don't, we don't want to just hand an organization a bunch of boxes when they have a biased opinion or if they're uneducated on who we're trying to reach with them. So once they've attended uh, this lecture night or, or viewed the lecture night, then they can get more boxes, up to 10 boxes per organization, and they can hand those out to people that they come across. And I want to mention there was two places in particular um, that people were in tears. The people that took those boxes from me were in tears. One of them specifically asked, who sent you? Do you know you're playing the part of an angel right now? They said, I don't know if I can get there because I'm so busy here. So I, I've a lot of those organizations cannot be represented tonight because they are playing the part of an angel tonight. So everybody keep all those organizations in your thoughts and prayers. And if you need or know of someone who needs information or any of these, if you, if you think they might need it, please come up afterwards and we will give you a box to take. If you represent an organization, don't forget to come get your boxes. If you don't need a box, we have plenty of information packs without all the gadgets. And with that said, please go out and find yourself a soda or a water or a snack, and then we'll be back here in 10 minutes to finish up. Thank you all.
So if I could have your attention, um, please. Our next presentation is going to be from a keynote speaker, author, and entrepreneur who, ch who actually trains companies on how to be inclusive to neurodivergent individuals. She also has been shortlisted for two Roses Awards and actually won the Bronze Award for her poster that she created. Um, she is autistic, has ADHD, as well as some other neurodivergent conditions. Alongside being a successful neurodiversity consultant, she's also a mother, a wife, intersectional feminist and environmentalist. Because she's all the way from the United Kingdom, we, her presentation has been recorded for convenience. So if you would just please direct your attention to Ms. Rachel Morgan Trimmer. Hello, my name is Rachel. I'm autistic and I've got ADHD, and I'm mildly dyspraxic. Today, I'm going to tell you how to include neurodiverse people. Today's workshop is all about you. So whatever you need to do to feel comfortable, that's absolutely fine. You can join in if you want. You might need a pen and paper for that, or not. If you wish, you can sit back and listen, or you can stare out the window. It's really up to you. I have chosen to um, represent you with a picture of a baby hedgehog because I'm sure you're that appealing and um, and also I think we can all relate to being a little bit spiky on the outside and kind of soft and fluffy on the inside. But I normally do this for people that um, I don't know, but I do know a little bit about you. Not you personally, but I know, um, this sounds creepy, but I know where you live, not your house. I know Oak Ridge because my father grew up there. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today because there's this personal connection. I actually visited Oak Ridge with my father um, in oh, crikey, 1998, um, picked him up from Knoxville Airport and, um, and we drove around and we saw his old house and we saw the, the church and everything. As you might have gathered, gathered my grandfather was a physicist and, um, and that's why why they were there. So when they lived there, there were no roads, so it was just boardwalks and uh, it wasn't on any maps and everything. So uh, I know Oak Ridge has changed a great deal um, since, the, since the 1940s. Um, and I know Knoxville has as well because we visited it. I know South High, I don't know if you're familiar with that, South, South High School in Knoxville, I believe is now being turned into, um, into apartments. So yeah, um, really happy to be talking to you in, in Oak Ridge today. I'm in Manchester in the UK. I really hope you can understand my, uh, my accent. So what am I going to be talking about today? First of all, we're going to see what neurodiversity actually is. I know you're, um, you're familiar a bit with the concept already. Then we're going to have a closer look at some of the conditions. Thirdly, I'm going to go over why be inclusive very briefly. And then finally, I'm going to talk about seven things that you can do today to be inclusive. So those are really um, broad tips that anyone can use, start using straight away um, in any kind of situation. So first of all, what is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is an umbrella term for a number of conditions. It also describes the differences in the ways different brains think. Some of the conditions you may have, what you probably will have heard of related to neurodiversity include dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, autism, dysgraphia, that's messy handwriting, and dyscalculia. I'm going to go over the first four of those in a bit more detail now. But first of all, I wanted you to have a look at this. It's a recipe. It's a recipe for a Victoria sponge. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's, um, it's a very popular cake in, in England. Um, two layers of sponge cake with, with jam in the middle. Very nice. But you can see this recipe is very hard to read, isn't it? There's weird spaces and, and you know, words separated and things like that. But there's something else in here as well. If you look closely, sorry, if you look further away from the screen or scrunch your eyes up, you might be able to make out a shape in the spaces. Can you see that? It's a fish. And that's a simulation of how dyslexic people see things. Dyslexia is characterized by seeing in shapes and not detail. And because words are made up of detail, that is why dyslexics struggle so much with reading and writing. 
Some of the characteristics you find with dyslexia, obviously the main one is challenges with reading, writing and spelling, and dyslexics vary enormously in how much this affects them. They have difficulty things order right getting in there. They can read words like this more easily. Now in this sentence, the first and last letter of each word is in the right place, but all the ones in the middle are jumbled up. A lot of dyslexics read like that anyway. So when a word is misspelt like that, as long as the first and last letters are in the right place, they can read it more easily than those without dyslexia. Dyslexics are creative and insightful. You see a lot of um, dyslexics in uh, you know, forward thinking positions at work because they're really good at spotting patterns, good at spotting anomalies in patterns and things like that. They have um, great ideas and can are really good at sort of putting two things that might not match together. Then visual and spatial thinkers, you see a lot of dyslexics and things like art and graphic design and architecture, of course, because they're much better at thinking in three dimensions than most people. And that seeing in shapes, they can translate to, um, you know, some, some really useful work and some really good communication. Some dyslexics are poor. You see high rates of dyslexia in things like the homeless population and uh, prison population because they never have the opportunity to fulfill their potential because they, don't, they tend not to get through school that well unless they're given a lot of support because we live in a world of words. Some dyslexics are loaded though. In this country, in the UK, um, about 40% of our CEOs are dyslexic and about 25% of our self-made millionaires. And that's because, um, you know, it's, it's partly they tend to go their own way, but it's also because of this creative brain that they've got and being insightful, spotting new opportunities, being able to make the most of it. It's, um, it's a really good talent for, for certain roles. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking to yourself, if one of these British dyslexics has, uh, has got so much money, maybe I want one of them for my next partner. And if you do, I've got a word of warning for you. They won't text you back. Now there's two reasons for this. The first is that dyslexics often take quite a long time to text. You have to think carefully about getting their words in the right order, using the right words, getting their spelling right and so on. So it takes some ages. And also I found a lot of dyslexics are afraid of judgment. They're afraid that you'll judge or shame them um, or embarrass them because their spelling or their writing uh, isn't as good as yours. And so because of that, they quite often avoid written communications where they can. So now let's do some origami. I've got um, this little bird for you to make out of the paper I hope you have on your desk. Now, if you're waiting for me to give you some instructions here, I'm not going to, because this is a simulation of what it's like to be dyspraxic. You can't make or unless you're like some origami master, you can't make origami without step-by-step -step instructions, right? Maybe some pictures or somebody demonstrating. And that's a little bit what um, it's like to have dyspraxia. Dyspraxia is a, a disconnect between the brain and the body. So you want to do a thing, you want to make an origami bird, but your, your hands just aren't gonna do it for you. So some characteristics you find in dyspraxia. Difficulty with fine and or gross motor movement. Some Dyspraxics have one or the other, some have both. So an example of a fine motor movement might be something like using a mouse or a pen or, of course, origami. And a gross motor movement is something that you might do with, with your whole body. So using gym equipment or um, riding a bike, stuff like that. They can't advertise women's sanitary products. That's funny, isn't it? Why is that? Well, it's because Everything you see women doing in their sanitary product ads are things that dyspraxics find really, really hard. So stuff like swimming and rock climbing, you can go for a run, riding a horse, that's all really challenging for a dyspraxic person. It's easy to feel like you're in a romantic comedy though, because you know that scene where the, the pretty girl comes out and she's holding the folders and she bumps into the handsome man and she drops them and then he helps her pick them up and then they get chatting and, and so on. Um, that's something that dyspraxics do a lot. We tend to bump into things and we tend to drop stuff a lot. Dyspraxics are creative problem solvers. So that means um, because 
we can't always do the things that we want to. We will find another way of doing them. So, for example, I didn't make that origami bird. I, I couldn't. So I, I sat. I didn't ask anyone to do it. I sat in front of someone I knew who's really good with her hands and tried to make it. And I knew she'd get frustrated enough and do it for me, which she did. So that was a way of um, of getting my bird made without actually asking anyone to do it, which is kind of a creative way of, of solving my my problem. Dyspraxic people are also quite persevering because we want to do the same things that our friends are doing, like swimming or riding a bike, but we find it quite challenging. So we, we carry on practicing until we can do it because it can be frustrating not to do the things you want. So we can be quite persevering. We have poor proprioception, which means knowing where you are in the world. So for example, if you were to reach your finger out towards your screen right now, um, you would probably be able to stop it before touching the screen, but this Praxic person might not be able to do that because we struggle to know where our body ends and other things begin. And of course, we have trouble saying stuff like poor proprioception. It is a difficult word, but um, dyspraxics have trouble sometimes pronouncing words because dyspraxia can affect all parts of the body, including the mouth. So next, we're going to play a little memory game. I'm going to show you some moving pictures and I want you to remember as much as you can about them. You ready? Let's go. So you saw a cat falling asleep, then a baby with a balloon, then a dog with a butterfly on its nose. You're suddenly going, wait, hang on, there was no baby with a balloon, aren't you? That's because this isn't really a memory game. It's a simulation of what it's like to have ADHD. And it's based on a real experience that I had when I went on a listening course. I've got ADHD and I went on a listening course. That's an example of how people with ADHD just don't think things through. And on this course, we were shown some videos and the trainer asked the class um, some questions about what the people were talking about in the videos. And so he said, what happened in the first one? And everyone else answered. I never answer because I always say the wrong thing. And I'm, I've not usually been paying enough attention anyway. So they answered the questions about the first video. And then he said, what about the second video? And they answered the questions. And then he said, and what about the third video? And I went, hang on a sec, he's playing a trick on us. There were only two videos. So I waited for someone else to say, there are only two videos. But they started answering questions. And I was thinking, what's going on? And I realized between the two videos that I remembered, there was another one in the middle. And I had just seen it, but not only had I forgotten what was in the video, I'd forgotten it had even existed. And that's how severe ADHD is. It's not just forgetting stuff, it's forgetting that you've forgotten. So ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And people describe it in different ways. But I like to describe it as being a space cadet mainly because people said you shouldn't describe yourself as a space cadet because it's kind of an, in I don't know if you have it um, in the US, but it's kind of an insult. Um, so I bought myself a t-shirt with official space cadet on it. ADHD comes in two flavors. To, oh, sorry about that. Type one and type two. So type one is a kind of hyperactive type, bouncing about all the time, and type two is um, inattentive. That's the kind I have, the daydreaming, the looking out of the window all the time. You can have both together as well. Here are some common characteristics of ADHD. We are forgetful. We are easily distracted. We are forgetful. We are messy. We are creative. That's one of my favorite things about, um, about having ADHD. We have ideas all the time. Um, we don't always act on them, but we can have like, I always say to people, I have at least 10 good ideas before breakfast. That's not really true, they're not all good, but I, you know, we have ideas going all the time. This is quite exciting and, and fun. We are inconsistent. We can hyperfocus. This is another of my favorite things about ADHD and a, a, something that a lot of people don't realize comes with. Um, if you've got ADHD, you can be distracted very easily, but the opposite is true. We occupy two ends of the focusing spectrum. So we're either completely all over the place or we're in the zone. And when you get in the zone, when you're excited about something and interested in it and, and passionate about it, we can hyperfocus for quite a long time. We're disorganized. We can multitask. This is another great uh, ADHD trick. And you'll find a lot of people with ADHD in jobs where multitasking is, um, is a benefit. So things like surgery, you know, a surgeon needs to be doing lots of different things at once or anything event-based like um, 
you know, theatre or concert, stage management, stuff like that. We've got all these different things going on that you need to, um, to be doing at the same time. We're good under pressure. And in fact, if that pressure doesn't exist, we will create it. And that is why you find people with ADHD doing things at the last minute, because we like that, that reward, that rush we get of doing something just in time. A bit like where Indiana Jones grabs his hat in the film and the, the rock wall thing is coming down. We, we get a real rush out of that. So that's one reason we're always um, doing things at the last minute or always late. And of course, they have difficulty finishing anything. So this slide is quite a, a good representation of the, uh, the ADHD brain. So we're going to do a little drawing exercise now. If you've got pen and paper, you can do um, you can do it there. If you've got um, you can do it on your computer if you'd rather, or your phone. Or um, if you don't want to do that, you can just imagine what I'm asking you you to draw and try and create a picture of it in your head. Okay? I would like you to draw, please, a baton ball. And I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to do that. So, I imagine you've drawn something not dissimilar to this. So here we have a picture of a table tennis bat and a ping pong ball. I imagine um, a lot of you have drawn a baseball bat and a baseball. Here in England, some people draw a cricket bat and a cricket ball. So if you've drawn something like that, you've done it wrong because that's not what I said. I didn't say bat and ball, I said bat and ball. So here we have a picture of a cricket bat and a ball, like the wild pig, the animal. If you heard me correctly and you drew that, a ball, not a ball, you have still done it wrong because that's not what I meant. I meant a bat, like the animal that flies at night, and a ball is in a boring person, and there's a little cartoon of me. The Arches is an old uh, British radio soap. Um, so how do you feel about that? You drew what you heard. You thought you were doing it right. And I told you you'd done it wrong. But really, that was my fault, wasn't it? You know what a bat and ball is? You see it on, you know, you play these games or you see it on TV all the time. Bat and ball makes perfect sense. Bat and ball makes absolutely no sense. So of course you didn't hear that. You heard something that made sense to you. And I use two words that mean different things. I use a bat can be what you play with or the animal. A ball can mean two different things. So I did several things here that made it hard for you to understand using words that sound the same, uh, using words that sound similar and saying something that doesn't make any sense. But when I asked you what you'd done, I said you've done it wrong. So even though it was all my fault for not communicating clearly, I blamed you for not understanding me properly, even though I was talking absolute nonsense. And that's how it feels to be autistic. Autism is a really complex condition, very hard to sum up in a single phrase. But one way um, I really like um, is the, the Maoris, you know, the, pe the native people in New Zealand, their word for autism translates as in their own time and place, which I think is a really nice way of kind of summing up the condition because we do feel like that we do feel in our that we're sort of in our own time and in our own space you've probably heard of the um the autistic spectrum and most people think it looks something like this so you've got norman at one end you've got a bit autistic in the middle and over there you've got rain man but the autistic spectrum actually looks more like this it's like a color spectrum like a rainbow and you find different things in different places on it and here are just a few examples of the things you might find on the autistic spectrum so you might have rigid thinking or rigid behavior crap social skills uh, some autistics are nonverbal good at maths is very common that's a stereotype isn't it obsessive interests and of course we're weird about being touched but it's more complicated than that so as I said at the beginning I've got ADHD so although I'm good at maths you can't really tell because the ADHD means I can't concentrate. Uh, we tend to cover up crap social skills by pretending everything is fine. Nonverbal, that can be by choice or not by choice. And um, obsessive interest has suddenly got very big there. I personally like Hello Kitty, but um, I wouldn't call that an obsessive interest. So that exists outside the spectrum for me. 
gastrointestinal issues can be the cause of some of that rigid thinking and behaviour, you know, not wanting to eat certain things, or it might be nothing to do with that. It might just be a coexisting condition with autism because about 95% of, of kids with autism have at least one co-occurring condition. Depression quite often runs through it there. Um, ADHD can lead to depression and depression can be the cause of some of those gastrointestinal issues. And depression also means, um, you know, you're weird about, but you need to be touched, but you're weird about being touched unless it's someone on a very specific list that only makes sense to you. Anxieties come in there, it's in the wrong colour and wrong font for some reason, and that leads to coping strategies, and depression leads to coping strategies, and ADHD leads to coping strategies, and suddenly pretending everything is fine isn't really working anymore, so you start drinking, and that leads to more depression, and there's a completely irrelevant banana. It's a really complicated picture, and it makes it hard to diagnose, not just autism, but anything at all. So just a quick question here for you. Do you think neurodiverse conditions are a disability or a difference? There's no real one answer to this and no real right answer. And I, I just like to ask it to people to see what they think really. And for you to think to yourself, is it a disability or is it just a difference? Or maybe it's a little bit of a mix of both. I think a lot of people find these days that, you know, the strengths mean, um, mean perhaps it's more of a difference than a disability, but it doesn't mean the challenges necessarily go away. So the next bit of this is why you need to take inclusion seriously. Well, there's one main reason and that's money. If you hire neurodiverse people, they're going to onboard quicker. That means they, they start learning how your place works quicker, um, more productive. They've done lots of studies in how productive neurodiverse people are, especially autistic. So you're looking at minimum 30% more productive and then Autistic people tend to be 50% more productive and when you put them in the right environment that shoots up to 90% or even 140% more productive than their peers. Inclusive workplaces have better collaboration, diverse teams have better collaboration, better perceptions of leaders, they make more money from innovative projects. I could go on about this for ages, um, but I won't. But the, you know, the long and the short of it is by being inclusive with neurodiverse people, uh, your organisation is going to make more money and you're going to be you're going to have a happier workplace because it's just the collaboration is better and it just all works better there's a few other reasons as well and you have a legal responsibility to uh, be inclusive it's cheap as chips or free some people are a bit afraid of neurodiverse inclusion they say oh it's going to cost us a load of things it's not it's we're talking about cheap cheap adaptations if any are needed and all the tips I'm going to show you today don't cost anything at all. And finally, it's the right thing to do, isn't it? Being inclusive is the right thing to do. And it's something we should all, even me, we all need to be thinking about and working towards. And finally, systemic inclusion benefits everyone. So by that, I mean, once you make start making some changes to be inclusive to neurodiverse people, you start to realise that um, those changes benefit so many other people. So for example, if you make a change um, for somebody with ADHD, an example might be cutting a meeting from an hour to half an hour because that's as long as they can concentrate. Who else is benefiting from that? Someone who's really busy, someone who's got a lot on, somebody going through the menopause who might have some brain fog, somebody with mental health issues, somebody with anxiety, someone who's got a physical condition that means they can't sit for a long time, and normal people because, you know, if you can get the meeting done in, in half an hour, then, you know, everybody's going to benefit because they can do something else afterwards. So that's just one example of how systemic inclusion, making adaptations for everybody will benefit everybody. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now and I'm going to show you seven things you can do to be more inclusive. So, um, first of all, Tell people what to expect. So at the beginning of this talk, I told you to, um, I told you what I was going to talk about. I told you four things. So you knew what was coming up. So you knew, you know, if you needed to nip out for whatever, you knew what was coming next and, and when you could go out and stuff like that. One, um, one really good example of this is these maps that we have. They're called ordnance survey maps. I love them because they show so much detail. I really like walking. This um, this particular map is an area near where I live with lots of hills in, which is lovely for walking. And um, 
if you have a look at some of the things on the map, you can see stuff like the contours show you how steep the hill is. So you know how much, you know, how much energy you're going to need to walk up it. And it shows you where the main roads are in case you don't want to walk on them and the rivers, but it also shows you where the toilets are. So you can plan your walk around that and it shows you uh, where the pub is so you can go for a drink afterwards. So that's tip one. Tell them what to expect. Tip two is um, use meaning and context to explain yourself, to explain things, why you want something done. Everybody needs a bit of meaning and context to understand the point of something. But neurodiverse people rely on it more heavily than most people. So if you say, can you do a thing? People might want to know why, what's the benefit? An example is um, of meaning and, and context is, um, if I say to my husband, can you go and get my black shoes? In my head, I know exactly which shoes um, I mean, but he doesn't because there's loads of black shoes. So I could mean this one, or I could mean this one, or I could even mean this one, which is technically a sandal, but he's, um, he's a man, so you know. So um, that's tip two, use meaning and context to help explain what you're talking about. I live near a big Chinese supermarket and I like to get these teas. Now, if I sent you to the supermarket to get me one of these, and I just wrote down the Chinese characters of the name of this tea, unless you read these naturally, if it's your first language or you're fluent, you're gonna to struggle to find that because that's, that's really tricky. Even if I told you the, the Chinese name, Lu Jiao Jiang, you might have trouble um, finding that because it's not words you're familiar with. And even if I told you, get me the peach oolong, there's a massive rack of teas at the Chinese shop. It's going to take you ages to find which one I need. But if I said to you, it's the pink one with a stag on it, you're going to find that straight away. So that's tip four, use pictures because they can, they can communicate information so much more quickly and easily sometimes than words. And this is particularly true for dyslexics. It, it's helpful for everybody, but for dyslexics, because they see in pictures, not words, it makes things much, much easier for them. Um, tip four is to make something memorable, make your information memorable. So, I use this sometimes. You probably you probably know Minecraft, right? So that's something you're familiar with. But look at this pickaxe. It's knitted, which is something a little bit unusual. And I have this as an example of something that you're familiar with, but there's something a little bit different about it um, to make it slightly more slightly more memorable. So if you're giving information to someone or you're trying to communicate with someone for some reason, having something a little bit unusual, a little bit more memorable is really, really helpful. Now, normally, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I know, as I said at the beginning, I know um, Oak Ridge, and I know it's in Knoxville, Tennessee, and we happen to have this cup in our house, which has Rocky Top Village, 1989, Knoxville, Tennessee, because my husband actually spent um, a summer there. He went to um, some international summer camps in Knoxville. So I've got something that relates to you to help make this memorable. Number five is to, um, to explain things clearly and concisely. We call that semantic prompting. So if you want to know a thing, ask someone a very clear and direct question. And a really good um, example of this is in a recipe book. I collect vintage recipes books. They're really fun. The recipes are all terrible, but their um, the graphics are quite fun. But in all recipes, you have um, you have a list of the ingredients, don't you? Here's a uh, struggle off. You have a list of the ingredients, and then you have exactly what to do. So when you're um, when you're communicating with someone, or especially if you're instructing them, and you want them to do something, having the idea of a recipe in your head is a really good way of making sure that information is clear. You tell them what they need, and then you give them step-by-step -step information on how to do the thing you want them to do. So that's, that's tip five, clear communication. Number six is to offer. Um, it really helps people feel safe if you think they might need something to offer it instead of waiting for them to ask, because it's really hard for us sometimes to ask for what we need, especially if we're undiagnosed um, and we might not even know what we need. And a really good example of, this, of how you do this already every day is uh, when you make somebody a cup of coffee. 
This is my American coffee mug. It's from Dean and Deluca. Um, so you don't you don't necessarily just give them coffee, do you? You say, do you want cream in it, or do you want some sugar? I've got my, little, my sugar pot here, and you ask them how they want it. So you're already doing it. But to be really inclusive, you can start doing that in, in a few more ways, a few more contexts. And some examples might be, do you want the lights on or off? Would you like the door open or closed? Would you like to sit here or over there? Do you want to come to the meeting or do you want it recorded? So when you offer things, you really, really help inclusion. And um, my last tip, I don't have a, a visual aid for because it's actually not doing something it, and that that's not being weird because sometimes it's very challenging for us to ask for something or do something a little bit differently and have people kind of call us out on it say why are you doing that why have you said that is that supposed to be a joke and it makes us very uncomfortable so if you're able to just let a few things go or um not be weird about it when someone says actually i need to stand up and walk around now or actually um, I need someone else to check this because my spelling's not very good. Just saying, okay, and not fussing about it or doing anything. It's a really, really good thing you can do to be inclusive. And of course, it's, it's low effort as well, isn't it? It's not doing something. It's not being weird. So to wrap up, I want to say that, um, you know, none of this stuff would work unless you've got the secret sauce. And that's the attitude. You have to want to be inclusive because otherwise it, none of the rest of it really works. You have to be committed to and wanting to include people. And obviously inclusion means a lot to lots of different kinds of people. But for neurodiverse people, it means even more because we spent our whole lives being told we're a problem, we're a challenge, we're difficult, and we're not really wanted. So for you to come and listen to me, uh, learn, talk about inclusion and want to learn about it, it means a lot to, to me, obviously, but it means a lot to every neurodiverse person, even more than you might think. So you've done a great job just by having the right attitude. And for that, I want to say thank you very much. If you'd like to um, get in touch with me, you're very welcome to. My website is www.sparkleclass.com. I'm on Twitter as Sparkle Class, and my full name is Rachel Morgan Trimmer, and you can find me on LinkedIn. So if you'd like to drop me a line, I would love to hear from you. And goodbye to all of you in Oak Ridge. Say that, um, you know, none of this stuff would work unless you've got the secret sauce. And that's the attitude. You have to want to be inclusive, because otherwise it, none of the rest of it really works. You have to be committed. To, and wanting to include people. And obviously inclusion means a lot to a lot of different kinds of people, but for neurodiverse people it means even more. Because we've spent our whole life being told we're a problem, we're a challenge, we're difficult, and we're not really wanted. So for you to come and listen to me, and learn, talk about inclusion, and want to learn about it, it means a lot to, to me, obviously, but it means a lot to every neurodiverse person, even more than you might think. So you've done a great job just by having the right attitude. And for that, I want to say thank you very much. If you'd like to uh, get in touch with me, you're very welcome to. My website is www.sparkleclass.com. I'm on Twitter as Sparkle Class, and my full name is Rachel Morgan Trimmer, and you can find me on LinkedIn. So if you'd like to drop me a line, I would love to hear from you, and goodbye to all of you in Big Ridge. So again, like she said, it really does mean a lot. Um, thank you all for your time and attention today. I would like to especially thank our wonderful keynote speakers. They obviously did an amazing job. We really appreciate all the valuable information that they had to share. Um, before you leave, PTK needs your help. Um, for our Honors in Action project, we would love your feedback so that we can use quantifiable data to facilitate more events like this one in the future. 
Each of you have been provided with hopefully a pen and your feedback form. So if you could just take a few moments of your time to provide this valuable feedback, it would be immensely helpful for our Honors in Action project. Please note that the feedback can be anonymous. Um, no individual responses are going to be shared with any third parties, and they're not going to be published or anything. Don't worry about that. Once your forms are completed, um, you can hand them to one of our lovely volunteers um, as you exit. Um, thank you all again for your attendance and participation. I wish you all a nice rest of your evening and a safe trip home. I would like to thank <clears throat> Kayla Coper for her awesome, awesome research and her passion for this. She's amazing. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. And don't forget your boxes. Don't forget boxes if you, if you need or want.